Uh, my name's Emily Bell. I'm the director of the Tao Center for Digital Journalism, uh, which is part of the Columbia Journalism School in New York. Thanks so much. Uh, one of the ideas that you brought up in our session today was the notion of having a civic media movement. Uh, I think you're talking about in the US, but possibly in other countries as well. Um, could you describe a little bit more by what you mean by that and then say why you think that's so important for uh, having a healthy democracy? Sure. So I think that it's an idea which is beginning to take root in the US because effectively America doesn't really have a civic media model in as, in as much as it does have, um, it's pretty uh, new um, and quite fragile. Um, what I mean by civic media is essentially, I guess, what you would call not-for-profit or media which is rooted in public purpose and the public sector, which doesn't have a commercial business model. Um, I think the reason for this uh, being an idea that we need to look at now, there's one very obvious one, which is the failure of the advertising models to support free media and particularly news. So really I'm talking about a, a, a very specific type of media which is um, public service journalism. Um, there are models elsewhere in the world. There's a very, for instance, mature set of um, public service broadcasters in Europe. Uh, they haven't, however, necessarily all reconfigured themselves for the digital age, and I think that's the crucial part of this, which is as we lose the business models that have sustained uh, journalism and, and quality journalism for the past 60 to 70 years uh, and we look to what the next phase of that's going to be. Um, I think that it's, it's clear that uh, most commercial media uh, are thinking that advertising is sort of on its way out in the same way perhaps that print is on its way out. It's not going to disappear tomorrow, um, but it is going to disappear in maybe 10, 20 years time as a really substantial part of what funds media. Um, and I think that this idea of how then do we get quality journalism, who, who will pay for it, uh, and we have several emerging models. We have the extremely rich person model, which is somebody like Jeff Bezos, takes over the Washington Post, um, has been an entirely um, reviving force there, has poured lots of money into it, is able to give it patient capital, that's terrific. But there is a limit um, to how many very rich people we want owning the media. It would be nice to have something else there as well. Um, there are successful models around subscription. Uh, the New York Times has one, the Washington Post has one, uh, the Financial Times has one, the Wall Street Journal has one. Um, but these are all often, I'd say, the sort of the luxury brands of uh, media and what they don't think about or what, they, what, what isn't built into their business model is the idea that you need well-funded, well-supported media which um, is available to everybody. Uh, so I think that, this co that there is a combination here, one of which is that the emerging business models don't really support sort of a civic, broad civic engagement. Um, and the second one being that the existing models, as, we, as we've named them, have gone away. Um, and I think if you, if you put that as well in the context of the large scale technology platforms having an outsized influence now in publishing, uh, if you think about what is the counterweight, you know, how do we, how do we counterbalance um, commercial technology and commercial media? This mixed model has some real benefits to it. You know, it's 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 a it's something which I think uh, needs to be able to work at very local level, um, as well as regional, as well as international level. Uh, and I think it's something where we need to rethink what that model would look like, what the public service model looks like, in the light of all the structural changes and the technology technological changes to the market. <laughs> so, so what is quality journalism is always a very contested term and I think that uh, as a journalist we would say well we know what it looks like when we see it. Uh, I think probably the victims of quality journalism might, might dispute whether or not it's quality journalism. Essentially what I mean is um, 
reporting into power, which is done in a sustained and honest, transparent uh, and accountable way. And that power might be small, it might be your local um, school board, uh, or it might be you know, the biggest powers on earth, it might be um, global government, uh, it might be the world's largest corporations, it almost certainly will be the technology platforms themselves. And I think that this is where we need to think about how the fourth estate has always been a separate entity to um, government, commerce, uh, the church, <laughs> etc. And how current communications platforms have uh, don't leave much space for separation. Everything is very much conflated. You know, advertising looks like editorial is treated like editorial. Editorial, if it's promoted, becomes advertising. Uh, the same companies that deal with um, journalism, uh, whether it's Google or Facebook or Twitter or whoever, are also dealing with governments. They're dealing with your... So, so you know, you, you may be a local reporter paid for by Google who is also investigating or perhaps having to report on um, software packages sold to schools or hospitals or, or local government, um, and you're having to look at the self-driving cars that are being put on the road. You know, do, is that relationship a healthy one? So in other words, these kind of enormous structures that have a lot of money, are they capable of supporting um, media, local media, or, 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 or paying for journalists? I, you know, yes, they are, but then I think, you know, we have to ask ourselves, do we really want them to be doing that? And I think the answer to that is, no, or if they are, we need other models to set alongside it. And so, when you're talking about a civic media movement, what would that model look like to your mind? Well, I, you know, I, if I knew if I knew that, um, I'm, I'm, I was about to say I might be a very rich person. I wouldn't actually. If I knew that, I would still not be a very rich person because I don't think it's a I don't think it is a commercial model. Um, I mean, I think it's very interesting because uh, obviously, you know, from, from a journalistic point of view, we want um, a sustainable model that pays reporters. Um, I think there are lots of other imaginative things that we can do with production technology. Um, I think there's lots we can do and figure out about um, what we think of as sort of civic content, which might not all be journalistic. Um, I think that there are lots of things like vacant spaces in libraries where you have the capacity to aggregate, um, you know, interrogate, report on um, local data, which are now sort of used in a completely sort of different way. I, do, I, I love this idea that they have in, I think, The Hague of what would local data ownership look like? What does the reporting function look like in that environment? Um, I think that, you know, you have to start really with willing organisations and willing investors. Um, uh, so to me, it's really about putting together or, or finding people who are interested in the idea motivated um, to build something, um, but not at the exclusion of supporting existing promising models. I think that's the other thing to say, that there's a lot of this activity out there. It needs sustained support, and I think it needs a structure um, and structural help and funding, which is appropriate for a long time horizon. I mean, if the question is ultimately one of how do you fund journalists, mm -hmm. where do you see or... Well, sort of. If, if by public funding you mean funding by the public, then probably yes. Uh, if you think about the way that journalism, as a commercial, um, commercially viable business, has been disaggregated, you know, the, 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 there was a large, if you like, sort of popular journalism, tabloid journalism, which actually has a very important role, um, has become, you know, the entertainment aspect of that. Uh, type of kind of performance of information has really very much devolved to the um, social web, you know, memes and and that kind of uh, that kind of thing. Um, lots of things that newspapers uh, and news organisations used to do that would make them money have you know gone. Uh, so if we're left with what are the things that uh, can't be paid for or won't be paid for buy a very different advertising, display advertising model or um, classified advertising model. 
then it really is, I think, this small subset of activity, which we would call accountability reporting. Um, and there are, I think, uh, lots of sort of, we, we, we've put a lot of um, emphasis in the past 10 years, particularly in America, on finding new business models for journalism. And it's almost as though the imperative to find a business model has outrun a, a really sort of serious conversation about what the purpose and skills of journalism should be and how we might want to change that. Uh, it's almost like if it makes money, it's, it's good. Uh, and what we know now is that, first of all, it's unlikely to make money. And secondly, if it does make money, it's probably it doesn't necessarily mean that it is good. There are profitable and good organisations out there, but there are also some very dynamic new models that are coming from public funding. That has to be seen, I think, as the fastest growing sector for funding this kind of activity. One of the things I was struck by is that you're talking about the reporting function as being the thing that we're losing. Um, well, it's the thing that's under threat. Under yeah. threat. Another function... I think that uh, traditional journalism has performed as is acting as a space of um, public deliberation, mm -hmm. um, a sort of a new form of city called the public square. Um, is that something that you see as being under threat, or that we might need new models to support? I think so. it's such an interesting question to say is public deliberation sort of an, and journalism's role in that uh, going away or, or, or changing. It's certainly not. Um, going away. There is much more, perhaps, not necessarily for good, there's much more public deliberation than we ever had in the past. Uh, and it is supported by an incredible sort of set of tools when you look at, you know, all the information platforms that are available to us that support peer-to-peer um, -peer communication, etc. Uh, I think the problem is that most of those platforms are not very journalistic. And by journalistic, I mean, it means that they, they don't have... Um, a core purpose, which is about making sure that that mediation works at some level. And it has to be said that news organisations have not always been great at that either. They are sort of, you know, um, your kind of typical um, opinion uh, columnist is a tablet handed down from the mount <laughs> to, to the grateful masses or the ungrateful masses, as it usually is, versus an actual sort of two-way dialogue. I think that actually there's a very strong role for a kind of modern type of journalism which helps signpost, um, mediate uh, and inform those conversations, uh, you know, when we think about, and I don't think that that is necessarily always separate from reporting. I think the best opinion or, um, you know, the best journalists in whatever capacity they're working in, whether they're editors or, or, or opinion columnists or, or, or copy editors, uh, there's always a kind of an element of reporting there, which is, you know, to find out what's going on before you synthesize, synthesize it. So I do think that, that sort of, you know, deliberative, can we have these public conversations? Who will bring things into the public arena for discussion in a way that is welcoming, as opposed to a way that is scolding or didactic? is a really important question for journalism. And it is definitely something that a modern news organisation ought to be thinking about how it does. The other thing I was thinking, oh, I want to ask you about in terms of your civic media movement. Um, we've heard a lot today about the uh, pension economy um, and mm -hmm. how it's not really only just about how we find funding for uh, reporting journalism, right. but also is that going to get the kind of <laughs> well, so, so, so I think this is, you know, again, this is a very interesting uh, question about sort of what if nobody reads it and the idea that public service journalism is by definition sort of worthy and dull. And we've seen lots of, um, so, I mean, so let's split that into two um, uh, parts, one of which is, is it always worthy and dull or will it not be read by anybody? Actually, people are ferociously interested in things which are of interest to them. So we've seen um, public reporting and often collaborative crowdsource reporting on things like healthcare costs. Uh, the people who, you know, the ProPublica did a great project in America on uh, called Dollars for Docs about uh, how much your local doctor is, or your GP or your specialist is paid by drug companies. People were phenomenally interested in that. Now, it's not going to get 
the huge engagement figures of Kim Kardashian asking Donald Trump to par pardon somebody. Um, but it's very engaging for a small um, and important constituency who not only kind of read um, and, and devoured that sort of coverage, but also participated by adding their own data to it. So the first thing is I do think it can be um, extremely sort of engaging. And often we see, particularly in investigative non-profits these days, those are the engine houses for actually sort of the best practices and engagement because they have to get people to read complicated, difficult stories. Um, and the way that organisations like ICIJ or Texas Tribune or ProPublica, um, the kind of methods that they have of engaging an audience in the reporting process and in the outcome are often the most sort of ingenious because the material they have is the most impenetrable. Um, but there is another side to this, which I think is important, is not often talked about, which is it is important to do stories that are not read. Um, and I've changed my mind on that. I used to think if you put something on the internet and nobody's reading it, it's a disaster. Uh, and, the, and I've changed my mind over a, a, a sort of the period of the last decade. Just really through thinking, I think, more a um, little bit more deeply about what we're actually doing in terms of constructing the public record. Uh, and how journalism can actually play an active and useful role, even when it's not actually seen by that many people. Um, I think for me, the most um, damning recent uh, example of what happens when everything has to be about attention was what happened in West London around Grenfell Tower um, and the disastrous fire there where I think 155 people perished. Uh, which was, um, it's a part of London that I know very well. Uh, it's a part of London that used to have an extremely sort of vibrant set of local papers. Um, and at the time of the disaster, there, there were none. Um, or there was rather one reporter that covered housing for a large part of West London, which is one of the most densely populated and richest boroughs in Europe. Uh, and I was interested in what had happened. And of course, you had actually a fantastic... Um, activist uh, set of residents who had um, their own very rich uh, blog who covered the hearings um, in the housing committee who documented their constant um, you know they, they, they constantly talked about the risks that they felt had been introduced by the change of materials and change of access to the buildings so it was all there but the problem is that they're an activist group there was no leverage for them in the broader community they didn't have a platform that applied the right pressure to the politicians um, and then the other news properties that I found in the area I started to sort of dig into well who owns them now how are they funded? And lots of them are, uh, well, I found one or two who were essentially just shells for advertising. So they appeared to be news organisations, but actually they were public relations agencies or they were owned by um, an, a, an, an advertising business. Um, all the reporting in the area had really been gutted by a number of factors, the internet and social media being one, Another being the fact that local authorities used to advertise in local newspapers and decided they would stop doing that um, about 10 years ago and they moved all their advertising into their own properties. Uh, and it was almost like a sort of a, a lesson in how that system, what happens when a system like that completely fails. And the answer, of course, would be, well, nobody's going to read public housing meeting minutes if you write them up and post them online or put them in a paper. And I think it's really important to recognise that some things actually don't become important until five or ten years hence or six months hence or whenever. And it's always been part of the journalist's remit to do that kind of reporting and that kind of story. It's always been supported by a cross-subsidy in the model. And as that cross-subsidy has gone, we have to find different ways. Now, it could be that that could be something that's automated, but I don't believe you can automate the process of having human inquiry and engagement and somebody who will join the dots, be close to the community, understand the structures. You know, that's a, that's a big ask for a robot to do that. Uh, okay. um, is there anything else?
No, I suppose the, I mean, the only thing I would say is that we spend a lot of time in media at the moment looking for solutions. Uh, and I think it's better to think about this as a process and it's better to think about it as an extremely long process. And we're right at the outset. And I think the thing that I feel very optimistic about is that we are having a broad based discussion about these ideas and these problems, which I don't believe we would have been having if it hadn't been for the 2016 presidential election in the United States. So you could say, well, I'm looking rather hard at a silver lining on a very dark cloud. <laughs> but if there's one to be taken, it's, it's really that we have now, I think, a, a timely discussion about what's happening in our information environment. Sorry, I went on rather a long time.